Yeah, I, I had heard, I mean, just from people through my networks, I guess, that there were left wing activists that were being like there were FBI agents that were showing up to their yeah. door, knocking, asking questions. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody had been detained or anything like that, um, but there was a real like it wasn't just an online thing. It was like a very real like FBI agent showing up to your door, trying to prevent people from doing something, whatever that would be. Um, yeah, I mean, what does that indicate to you? Um, cause I, I feel like a lot of this attention it's, and the reason why a lot of people are like, so giddy about the idea of the FBI tracking down these people that participated in the Capitol riot, um, is, you know, I mean, obviously these are people that are, uh, <laughs> you know, proto-fascist or whatever you want to call them. I mean, like these MAGA, uh, chuds kind of storming the capital and it's like yeah there's these you feel like there needs to be some retribution there because it was so frightening and and terrible uh to see that happen but like to then ask or to to uh applaud federal agencies finally doing something about white supremacy white supremacist extremists in this country and not really reflecting on how these agencies have actually turned a blind eye to these groups for a really really long time and um, and that's something you addressed really in your article. The F, you know the FBI can't investigate white extremism until it first investigates itself. So for people that are maybe unfamiliar with the history of the FBI's targeting of left wing activists and people seeking racial justice and civil rights activists and that, I mean, just give us a few maybe highlights of of things we should maybe know about the FBI in regards to that. Yeah, uh, I mean. Basically, the entirety of the FBI's history has been exactly that, where they've prioritized uh, Black organizers specifically, um, Black movement specifically, and just any movement that seeks to create some sort of substantial social change within the United States. Um, I want to say like radical movements, but that's not even true. I mean, they went after the civil rights movement. Um, and a lot of it started, I think the earlier, the earliest I could find was the targeting of Marcus Garvey. Um, and his movement um, that brought a lot of um, Black Americans together, Black Americans together in like uh, the twenties, and uh, you know Marcus Garvey, in my opinion, wasn't like th the most extreme radical in the world. He wasn't necessarily talking about like a full like overthrow of the capitalist system and an establishment, mm -hmm. uh, like you know a fully new nation or anything in the United States. Um, and at the same time that you have Marcus Garvey doing what was like reasonable work for black people in the twenties, you had things like the Tulsa race riots and what had already been a long history of white supremacist violence, starting with the, the creation of the KKK after uh, the civil war with things like the Wilmington coup of 1898 in which white supremacists overthrew the city government of Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, and no one was ever punished. The people who committed those crimes became governors, became senators. Um, so you, you have this clear history that are, was already established by the time the Tulsa race riot happened, um, in which white people stormed into Tulsa and went about massacring hundreds of black people. Um, it, it was the threat has been here for quite a long time, and the the predecessors of the FBI, you know, did not investigate Tulsa. Uh, President Harding, you know, made one comment about Tulsa uh, at the time, and that was pretty much it. But at the same time, the FBI was like, "These black folks are rising up. We need to, we need to squash this." They, you know, they're 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 talking ideas and thinking, you know, big things about politics, and you know, and it really comes to head more um, in the 60s and 70s where we can see it more clearly and explicitly uh, with COINTELPRO, which is a counterintelligence program mm -hmm. um, created by the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover, um, who was um, the director of the FBI for most of its history, um, starting um, even the, being an agent with the predecessor organization and, and then personally investigating Marcus Garvey himself. Um, so this program was basically created to squash any form of dissent, really, in the United States. Um, it did focus a lot on radicals, but it still um, it uh, it targeted people within the civil rights movement. The most famous case of it being the threatening letter sent to Martin Luther King, um, asking him to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is other um, cases that are becoming more prominent, like the assassination of Fred Hampton. There's a movie coming out about Fred Hampton's life, I think, in a couple of days or like a 
February 14th or something like that. Not like I need to promote them. the FBI, um, starting with Marcus Garvey, uh, creating this idea and Hoover becoming obsessed with this idea of the black messiah rising up and a black organizer and leader in the country that could organize both black people, other people of color and working class white people into an alliance that would eventually overthrow uh, the system. So Hoover was absolutely obsessed with this idea and continued to identify different people who fit that criteria from Martin Luther King um, down to Fred Hampton. Um, so Fred Hampton was a 21 year old um, organizer from Chicago who helped really build the NAACP in Illinois, which isn't always a big part of his story, um, who was then assassinated um, you know, in bed um, at 21 by the FBI or well, by the Chicago Police Department in coordination with the FBI. Mm -hmm. um, and he was also killed. Um, um, there was another a young man killed at the same time. I'm forgetting his name, which I feel horrible. Um, I wanna say Mark Clark um, was shot there, but he was less prominent, he was younger. Mm -hmm. um, and there was this you know, whole deal where the Chicago Police Department made it seem that it was a shootout, uh, but the Panthers actually kept the house open for um, journalists from all over the world to come and investigate themselves. And they found that not a single shot was fired from within the house. In fact, the only shot that was fired within the house was a shotgun blast from one of the Panthers um, as he was, you know, dying um, and just uh, pulled the trigger. Um, so it's clear that this was like an attack on people who were armed at the end of the day because they saw something like this coming, uh, but they were not in a position in which they were able to fight back, partially because they were drugged by an FBI informant um, who had uh, been working as a member of the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is like, you know, one of the more extreme things that they did, but it, it's not, you know, the only case. They also helped trigger a war between uh, the Black Panther Party in LA and the US organization, which was a black nationalist movement, a lot more like, you know, centrist to right wing in its orientation. Um, and there is um, some claims and some evidence that the people, um, who murdered the leaders of the Black Panther Party in LA were actually FBI informants themselves. The US organization claims that they were never members of the US organization. The Black Panthers claim they were members of the US organization. Um, but over time, uh, we've seen some evidence that these people were had been working with the FBI prior. And regardless, at the bare minimum, we know as a fact that the FBI stoked the war between the US organization and the Panthers by sending letters back and forth between both organizations, uh, basically, you know, talking. Uh, smack about each other. Can I curse? Or, or, yeah, yeah, please say whatever. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, so, yeah. yeah, they they instigated. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, a beef between the uh, the organizations, and um, another example that's uh, really not talked about much was the establishment of the secret army organization in San Diego. And so this was a paramilitary terrorist organization, basically funded by the FBI. It was the successor organization to um, the Minutemen who were a white supremacist organization created like in the early 60s for the purpose of preventing a leftist takeover of the United States. They, they feared like a communist revolution or some sort of like, you know, left-wing president. So they started preparing themselves for guerrilla warfare. Um, against the left and armed themselves. Um, they eventually fell apart in, um, I think 1968 after the prosecution of one of their leaders, but the FBI basically was like, they were, they were great informants. We might as well bring them back for, you know, the, for the, for the sequel. Um, so they helped rebuild the organization um, under themselves, armed them um, and helped them coordinate bombings of cars buildings, including a movie theater in San Diego, and the attempted assassinations of a Marxist professor and the leaders of uh, the Chicano organization, the Brown Berets in San Diego. Um, and there was also evidence that they coordinated all the way up with um, up to the White House with the White House aide who was aware of these actions. Um, and, you know, these these stories go on and, you know, the officially COINTELPRO ended after it was uncovered. Um, but, you know, there's it, just, it seems kind of like a fantasy to believe that the FBI would just be like, oh, we got caught. We're, we're going to stop doing this we're now. Down. We got us. Um, especially uh, with things that happened later, um, like finding out that FBI agents had participated in the old boys uh, roundup, which was uh, mainly um, ATF agents who like led this event for 16 years um, in which um, 
basically white uh, federal agents would come together for like a cookout, um, probably tons of fun for them, um, in which they, uh, one of the things that happened there was like the selling of, um, I think it was like Negro, like it was like Negro hunting cards or like hunting permits. Um, they sold t-shirts that had the face of Martin Luther King and the crosshairs of a sniper. Um, it's just like, you know, general white supremacist shenanigans. Um, sure. And, you know, the FBI did disavow the agents that they, they caught there, but I'm like, okay, your agents were doing this for 16 years and you only disavowed it and bothered to investigate it after they were already caught. It seems like a pattern where the FBI is like, you know, we'll, we'll somewhat admit to something once they're caught and be like, we're, we're never going to do this again. We're never going to allow this to happen while not doing any really substantial investigation of their own ranks. So it's really ironic, um, you know, at this point in history, in which they have created this new black identity extremist label, um, you know, in response to the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, and have already used it to target black uh, organizers. Um, and the most prominent case, they used uh, Facebook posts as the evidence uh, to target a black organizer. Um, and um, so it, it just feels really weird that the FBI is taking the lead on investigating white supremacy when it's been clear that they've been aware of white supremacy um, or the infiltration of white supremacists into police departments since the 60s, um, where they fed inf information um, to local police departments, despite knowing that they were infiltrated by the Klan, um, information about civil rights activists. Um, so it's like they, they've known about this for decades, for arguably, I would assume, really the entirety of their existence. Mm -hmm. um, and once again, it seems like they're only doing something partially because the public um, is concerned about it and there's a lot of push. Um, and it just, yeah, it's just kind of odd and like sick that they're doing this without actually doing any formal examination of themselves and kind of selling themselves as like this champion uh, of progress or the champion of, you know, uh, fighting for racial equality now. And it's also kind of terrifying that much of the media hasn't really talked about this either. And a lot of it has been framed as like, oh my God, finally, finally our heroes are here. The white knights are, have come to save us yeah. uh, from white supremacy. Finally, they're doing something about white supremacy uh, while missing, you know, the entirety of the FBI's history, including the history of the last like, you know, two years. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I just, something that just came up in my mind and it's been in my mind a lot lately um, is this, parallel when you talk about this for instance the at the end of hoover's tenure i'm quoting from your article towards the end of uh hoover's tenure the fbi went so far as to allegedly create an army far-right paramilitary organization in san diego which you just described there um this is exactly what the cia does in other countries they fund far-right paramilitary organizations and death squads and back dictatorships um, right. Like that's, that's, okay. that's from the CIA playbook and that is being replicated or done exactly in the same way in the United States through the FBI. And it's just worth noting that parallel, like the same, it seeming seems like the same type of ta tactics are employed within the United States as there is uh, say in central or South America, for example. And I just wanted to just bring that up because that's, yeah, that's a big thing, but I mean, what do you make of this, the fact that the FBI now is seemingly going after people that participated in this Capitol riot? I mean, I think that there has to have been a threshold that's been crossed because, again, they didn't do anything about the KKK. They didn't do anything about any of this other stuff. In fact, they backed a lot of these types of organizations. You mentioned that paramilitary organization and, and so many other examples, political assassination, all of these other tactics they've employed. And now with like Trump and the kind of thing that he fomented in the United States culminating on January 6th with tens of thousands of people storming the Capitol building. It's like something, some threshold had been crossed where the actual, I don't know, something, something in, in the minds or in the organizations like, like the FBI, just something had clicked where they were like, we have to now employ our resources to target these people that are maybe a threat to the establishment in some way. I mean, th but there had to be a lot that had to happen for, for him to get to yeah. that point, right? I mean, seems that way. 
Yeah, totally. And um, interesting, I want to say fun fact, it's not that fun, but um, one of the the people chosen to lead the secret army organization had actually participated um, with the uh, Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba and worked with the CIA. So there's even a direct link between the CIA and the FBI uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to the establishment of the army. Um, and yeah, yeah, I guess I- I'm seeing it as like, um, kind of like from two ways where I think one of it is like there was this breach of acceptable behavior uh, from the far right where this was like, you know, really attacking um, like the state itself and actually fundamentally attacking the government uh, by having like uh, far right people and fascists uh, storming the U.S. Capitol. So I think like that's a big part of it. Um where, um, yeah, a lot of these actions in the past were directed towards the left and tar- targeted towards people who weren't really in power. Though the, I think there are some examples of the FBI, um, you know, threatening presidents with blackmail. And that there's at least two presidents who've, you know, in private mentioned being afraid of the FBI. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think the other part of it is that there's so much public pressure around it in a way where I think, you know, conservatives and centrists might have in the past been the only people calling for more FBI action. And I, I think having liberals and a good chunk of the country on the same page and calling for this action um, uh, is a little bit of a game changer. Um, yeah, and that in combination with the, the real threat that these fascists posed to uh, elected officials and like members of Congress, which I think is just a whole new um, level uh, for uh, the far right, uh, make, maybe they threatened you know one or two people in the past, or or like at a time. But like the idea of actually going after the institution itself, which I think, um, I, I mean, I don't think the FBI is inherently just like filled with racist clan members. There's probably some in there. Um, I think its fundamental existence is about protecting, you know, the state and protecting the United States as it stands. Um, and the reality is that we live in a white supremacist country. Um, and uh, I think that's been a lot of why the FBI has behaved the way it is. Uh, it has, like, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Even I read this, it's this embarrassing article by an FBI agent um, in which he was offending Hoover, saying that he's not a racist because he never used the N word at any point, which I'm like, <laughs> really? Is that the marker here? But I'm also like, okay, there is something about like, he just understood fundamentally that black people are a threat Mm -hmm. to the white supremacist order that he works for. Um, It's not that he is like woke up every morning was like, God, I hate black people. Um, And I think that's just as insidious. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what's playing out here that the FBI is like, you know, they came after daddy and like, we can't have that. Um, And um, yeah. And I think the public pressure is also real. Um, particularly at a time where I think people in the FBI, uh, uh, especially considering, you know, Biden isn't really uh, doing much of a change of the guard in the FBI, which I think is, you know, interesting. And he's like, well, they're, they're a bunch of centrists who mean well, is his whole analysis. Um, so we're going to have a lot of people from the Trump, you know, I uh, guess the Trump FBI actually staying on. So I think there's also a part of them that wants to differentiate themselves and be like, yes, we're not actually the Trump FBI. We're the real FBI here for justice and love and, you know, everything. Sure. Uh, wonderful. Mm-hmm.